for a while. Took us several months to get through Romans chapter 1 because we mean business in this letter. We're not going to take it for granted, but we're going to mine it for truth. And today as we enter into uh, chapter 2, I hope you'll be taking notes this morning because we're going to cover a lot of ground about this ongoing, difficult passage that Paul gives us. It's a heavy, weighty thing that he's talking about all through the from the middle of chapter 1 all the way into really chapter 3. He's given us some heavy duty stuff. And he's talking specifically here at Romans 2 about that day. About that day. Judgment day. I don't know about you, but I get a little worried when we talk about judgment day. Because I'm not sure what to say about it all the time. There's so many different views and so many different ideas about it. There's so many different people that have different kind of perspectives on it. In fact, this morning, I did a little Facebook Live on my way into the building like I do a lot of times, and I just asked the people that were watching to let me know, when you think about Judgment Day, what do you think about? What comes to your mind? And I got some good responses. Rochelle, my good friend in Florida, said, I'm scared for those who don't know Jesus as their personal Savior on Judgment Day. It breaks my heart for those that don't know him. Susan Farnham said she thinks of being clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Janet Young says judgment day will be the best of days and the worst of days. Dawn Rockstro says, I hope, I sh- sorry, she says she has hope for those of us that believe and follow the Lord, but fear for those that we love that do not. Carrie Sue Reamer said, my attorney will be there. His name is Jesus. <laughs> Annie says, this is the last one. I thought this one was uh, maybe the heaviest response. She said, um, part of me can't wait to be with God. And part of me fears that I'll hear, I never knew, knew you. And having to be accountable to all my sins because every day I think about how unworthy I am of Jesus' sacrifice for me. But thank you, Jesus, for loving me enough despite my failings to die for me. My peace is knowing that God is in control. Come on, that's good. That's good, isn't it? I think all of us experience this combination. When we think of Judgment Day, we think of this combination of, yes, it's going to be a glorious, glorious day when God finally sets everything straight back to the way he intended it. But we also kind of have this a little bit uneasy about it, right? I mean, because there's a lot of people, there's a lot of people that are going to stand there and say, we did all the right things. And he's going to say, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who break God's laws. So I I think we've got kind of a combination of both. And I think right now, not only do we have an uneasy feeling about it, but I think we're all wondering about it. We're wondering about it because we're looking around in the world around us and we're wondering, look at what's happening. Could we be getting close to it? Somebody tell me, tell me about maybe a sign of, of the time that we may be seeing in our headlines today. It's it's your turn. You can talk. War and more war and more war, right? All the time. What else? Say that again, Susie. You see people turning towards God? Wow. Okay. Okay. That's a big surprise. I need to tune into whatever channel you're watching. (laughs) Yeah, okay. uh, Okay, yes. We have a lot of people here locally that God is doing something in. Absolutely. Uh, I think, though, as a nation, we're seeing the opposite. We're seeing people turn from God. We're seeing the body of Christ seemingly dying out. What else? I heard somebody over here somewhere rioting all the cities burning society crumbling around us what about the political unrest and you know i've been watching carefully for years now the progression of technology where uh they now now they are implanting chips in people 
in their arm, right? So that it's got all of their identity information, including medical records. And for some people in some of those high-rise complexes, you know, downtown and various places, you know, that's your key card. You just show up and it reads your wrist and it knows that you're there. And, you know, they're talking about with the, with the uh, change shortage that we've had recently, I'm hearing more and more about moving all cash to that form of payment, some sort of digital form. And, you know, the credit cards have proven that they're insecure. And now we've gone to phone payment. And pretty soon I wonder if we'll just go to... A cashless society altogether where somebody can track every dime you spend. And I look at all that and I just know, I just know that it sounds like end times, right? In Romans 2, Paul gives us a little insight about the end. He says this, he says, because you're stubborn and refuse to turn from your sin, you're storing up terrible punishment for yourself for a day of anger is coming when God's righteous judgment will be revealed I just want to pause just pause on that for a second a day of God's anger have you ever had a day of anger have you ever had that moment where it's just all piled up and piled up and piled up and piled up on you, and then something happens, usually something insignificant, usually something really small, breaks the camel's back, and then all of a sudden you lose it on someone. Okay, maybe that's just me. Maybe you never do that. But I know I've had times, I, I can think of a specific time in our past where it was bad thing, bad thing, bad thing, and then it was a very expensive thing, and then it was just, I mean, just all of it fell, and I just, I got furious. And I don't get this way very much, but I was, I was outside, and I don't remember what I was carrying, but whatever I was carrying, I just yelled, and I just threw it as hard as I could. And my whole family saw that little outburst, and they were like, Dad, we don't ever want to see that out of you again. <laughs> My kids talk to me that way. <laughs> I don't know if you have that, but nobody wants to see my anger outburst. Because when I get angry, I might break something. Or I might hurt your feelings. Or I might tick you off. If you know someone that has anger issues, they might make life kind of miserable. They might not just break things or tick you off, but they might also cost you a lot of money. Or they might hurt you. Human anger is a bad thing. But here Paul is talking about a day of God's anger. The God that breathed the universe into existence. What must that look like? He says, a day of anger is coming when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. He will judge everyone. Uh, raise your hand if you're ev an everyone. Are you an everyone? You can raise your hand if you are. Okay, raise your hand if you're not an everyone. Okay, he will judge who? Everyone, it says, according to what they have done. Okay, wait, wait a minute, Steve. Hold, 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 hold what? What? Um, I thought that I'd got to skip that altogether because I'm covered in righteousness so what well we'll talk about that next week so you'll have to be here next week to get that um, he will judge everyone according to what they have done he will give eternal life to those who keep on doing good seeking after the glory and honor and immortality that God offers so no pressure it's a big day a day of God's anger, a day when everyone will be judged, when he sets everything right once and for all. He will let no crime go unpunished. Man, can I get an amen on that? Amen. Problem is, I know I'm a criminal. So, praise the Lord, and I'm also a little uneasy about it. 
And then I look around at the headlines, and i got to ask the question, and it's the first blank on your page, is this it? A lot of people are asking the question. They're looking at the headlines, and they're asking the question, is this it? Are we coming up on it now? I mean, you've probably talked about it. I've, I've had a lot of people talk to me about it in recent days, the last few months. But some of us in the room have been around the block more than once. Can I get an amen on that? Anybody been around the block more than once? Yeah, okay, a few of us have. Thanks, Paul, for raising your hand. So I know, I mean, I know. I, I don't know if you remember this, but this question, is this it, kind of seems to come and go a lot, does it not? Anybody here ever heard the name Harold Camping? He was a, a Christian evangelist, and he was really, really big back in the, I guess, 80s and 90s, had a lot of followers. I had never heard of him until about 10 years ago. Uh, but he, uh, big, a lot of followers, he predicted that Judgment Day would occur on September 6, 1994. And then on September 7th, he redid his math and changed it to September 29th. And then on September 30th, he changed it to October 2nd. <laughs> and a little bit later on, he refigured all of his stuff and drew his lines again and did his calculations. And he predicted it to happen on May 21st, 2011. And then there would be the final destruction of the world. And then Harold, Camp, Harold Camping died in 2013 at 93 years old, never having seen his predictions come true. Remember that kind of stuff? Those kinds of things happened. Do you remember in 2012, everybody was talking about the Mayan calendar and how it was cycling around and coming to the end of the era and it would mean destruction and the end of the world. And then it didn't happen then. Some of you remember Y2K. Remember that? And the digits were all going to line up the wrong way on the computers at midnight on January 1st of 2000, and everything was going to fall apart. It would become the end of the world, and not a single light blinked, as far as I know. Does anybody here remember the NASA, the retired NASA scientist who calculated the 88 reasons that Jesus would return in 1988. There was a book. He wrote a book. 88 reasons why the rapture is in 1988. Edgar something, yeah. So I remember this book. I remember looking through this book. Oh, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. You know, this question's an old question. Uh, I put the little red line here because I just didn't want you to see. I don't, I don't think I've got a slide where I took it off. Um, <laughs> Because it would just be too ironic. It says 88 reasons why the rapture is in 1988. And then using good King James language, he right here he has a statement that says it's because it's the year of the Trump. <laughs> so I just blacked it. I just, I, just put it, I just blocked it out. Just, you know, didn't want to confuse anybody. I thought that was funny. Um, this question's been around for a long time. Right? It's been around for a long, long, long time. In fact... This question's been around at least since Jesus' day. Is this it? How will we know this is it? Right? In Matthew 24, Jesus is sitting on the Mount of Olives, and his disciples come to him, just the disciples, privately, and they say, tell us, when will all this happen? What sign will signal your return and the end of the world? What are the signs is this it how will we know and you know how jesus always answers this right i mean everybody always wants to know tell us about the signs of times tell us when it's going to happen want to know when it's going to happen let's set a date let's pick a time on our calendar let's get you know ready and jesus says in matthew 24 he says no one knows the day or the hour when these things will happen not even the angels in heaven or the son himself only the Father knows. Jesus is like, man, it's not my job to know. That's one thing that, that the Father has withheld from me. I don't even know. And so I've just kind of always taken, if Jesus says, I don't know when it's going to happen, then when I hear other people set dates, I just kind of walk on by. I kind of feel like if you've set the date, that's when you can almost guarantee it won't happen, right? 
So Jesus is pretty clear that no one knows the day it's going to happen, but he was clear about a lot of stuff. Jesus actually talks a lot about the end and the signs that are coming and what will happen there. In fact, you can find in the Old Testament and the New Testament a lot of descriptive language about the end. I just want to look at a little bit of what Jesus says about it in Matthew 24. Here's what he says. He says this about the end times. He says, don't let anyone mislead you. For many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah. So there's going to be a lot of people saying, follow me during the end times. But they will deceive many. And you'll hear of Steve wars and threats of wars. But don't panic. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. Nation will go to war against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world. But all this, it's only the first of the birth pains with more to come. Yeah, it gets worse. He says, then you, believer, you will be arrested, persecuted, and killed. You, believer, will be hated all over the world because you are my followers. And many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Sin will be rampant everywhere, and the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. The good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all nations will hear it, and then the end will come. This is only a small part of what Jesus says about it, but I wanted us to kind of get an insight into what he says. And, and really, if I could just sum it all up, Jesus says, next blank, he says, it will get much worse. It will get much worse. I'm saying that in September of 2020. Can you imagine it getting much worse? We're sitting in a room together, brothers and sisters, body of Christ, but having to keep six feet apart and wear masks because it's that bad. Our cities are burning. We're scared to go where we normally go. Our politicians are angry, and there doesn't seem to be any truth anymore because you can watch one news channel and get the story, but watch the other news channel and get a completely different story. And Jesus says it's going to get worse. It's going to get worse. So I know we like to put stuff on Facebook, and we love the memes about how bad 2020 is. Jesus says you ain't seen nothing yet. They haven't started hunting you down to kill you yet. It's going to get worse. It's going to be ugly. It's going to be painful. And I just want to kind of take a minute and just pause for a second and just say, listen, it's so tempting for me and you, you know, theological, deep, deep students, right? Aren't we all biblically educated, theologically aware, right? Transubstantiation, Susan Farnham put it on our Facebook the other day and people were like what <laughs> so yeah so we I mean okay it's really easy for us American Christians with just a little bit of knowledge to, to look at headlines and to have a few key verses and to connect dots and draw a picture of oh okay it's coming now the cities are on fire it's coming now there's division like crazy, it's coming now. There's a war, it's coming now. Unexplained explosion in Beirut, it's coming now, right? I mean, we can draw those lines, it's easy. <clears throat> but I just want to encourage you. It's been 2,000 years since Jesus gave these words, and nations have risen and fallen. The biggest empire known to man at that time, Rome, fell. Just a few short decades after Jesus spoke these words, I just want to encourage you, don't confuse the rise and fall of individual nations, including our own, with the great plan of God. See, God's plan transcends the rise and fall of all nations. And America may be over, or it may live on and be greater than ever. I hope for the latter. But I trust in the kingdom of God, not the kingdoms of this world, right? Right? 
I'm going to say it again. I trust in the kingdom of God, not the kingdoms of this world. That includes the United States of America. So Jesus says it's going to happen. And you don't know when it's going to happen, but when it happens, it'll happen quickly. In Matthew 24, Jesus says, When the Son of Man returns, it will be like it was in Noah's day. In those days before the flood, the people were enjoying non-social distance banquets and parties and weddings. <laughs> right up to the time Noah entered the boat, people didn't realize what was going to happen until the flood came and swept them all away. That's the way it will be when the Son of Man comes. What he's telling us, next blank, is that most of us are going to get caught by surprise. Most of us will be caught by surprise. You hear me? He's saying it'll be a surprise. Not just it'll happen when you least expect it, but I think we'll be caught by surprise in, as in, oh, no, I, I didn't think that was really going to happen. Uh, wish I'd have lived my life a little different. Wish I'd invested my time, my money, my energy a little bit differently. Most will be caught by surprise, even believers, right? In 2 Thessalonians 2, Paul tells us that that day will not come until there is a great rebellion against God, Susie, a great rebellion against God, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the one who brings destruction. So the Greek word here for rebellion against God is the Greek word apostasy, and it means a great turning against God. Literally, it means a religious, a significant religious turn against God. In other words, the people of God will turn on him. I think we're seeing that in the world today. I know, praise the Lord, we have pockets of great things happening. I mean, you look in Korea, there are people getting saved like crazy. I know some spots in South America where I'm seeing the Holy Spirit work like crazy. But if you look in America today, it seems that we're turning more and more against him, away from him. You know, in the shutdown, I, I showed it at the VIP meeting we had the other night, a graph that showed how in the shutdown, um, there was this great decline of uh, retail stores, sales, and this great decline of restaurant sales. But it did not compare at all to the decline in church participation. And people have just seemed to walk away. And I just wonder, I wonder if we as a nation haven't just done enough to say, God, we don't want you in our schools. We don't want to let prayer be legal. We don't want the Ten Commandments in front of any buildings. We, we just want to act like you never existed, God. And I wonder if God's not finally just going, okay, see how that works for you. There will come a day. And I think we see this apostasy happening. Tell me if this doesn't sound familiar. 2 Timothy 4. For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own what? They'll follow their own what? They'll follow their own desires. And they'll look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear they will reject the truth are we seeing truth rejected in our nation today are we seeing truth rejected in church today i'm seeing it in a lot of pockets they will reject the truth and they'll chase after myths myths maybe about the end times myths about race myths about gender Myths about liberty, myths about truth, myths about who God really is and what he's really about in this world. It's been coming on us for a long time, and now it seems to really be accelerating. And I feel like we, the body of Christ, have been like a frog in that pot that slowly comes to a boil, and it may be getting late because then it happens fast. 1 Thessalonians 5, he says, For you know quite well that the day of the Lord's return will come unexpectedly, like a thief in the night. It'll be so unexpected, and it'll be so ah, divisive 
that listen in Matthew 24 Jesus is talking he says two men will be working together in the field one will be taken by Jesus the other left okay so in, in, envision this it's not two anonymous men it's you and your brother it's you and your friend it's you and your co-worker one of you will go and one of you will stay two women will be grinding flour at the mill that's you and your sister or your co-worker one will be taken and the other left it'll happen suddenly it'll happen immediately and it will be unexpected some will be taken by Jesus and some will be left for ultimate destruction some will survive and some won't you know, Jesus describes that judgment day as you know, gathering everyone together then separating them out and saying you sheep come with me forever and you goats go into eternal destruction and which one are you yeah I'm so confident I'm so confident that day I'm covered in his blood yet he will judge everyone according to his works and I know I'm a criminal everyone because I'm an everyone the only hope that we have is we know that God so loved the world he gave his only son that even though you and I were criminals against a holy God even though every breath that we take we are stealing it from him we don't intend to give it back to him we're going to use it for our own sake our own good our own desires we're criminals against God and deserve judgment deserve punishment the wages of sin is death but he's loved us so much that he gave his son and his son took our punishment for us you hear me he took your punishment for you he experienced judgment in your place he went to the cross and everything that you had ever done wrong every horrible heartbreak you ever went through every ugly word you ever uttered every lie you ever told everything you ever stole every way you ever cheated was put on to Jesus and he took the blame he said blame me not him blame me not her and he was punished for you on that cross he died for you but then three days later he rose again and now he lives his life in me and in you he lives in us and through us redeeming us and reforming us into his image can somebody say amen to that that's what he does in us praise the lord so jesus speaks to us those of us us believers he speaks to us people who have placed our trust in jesus and he says this, he says, you believer, you too must keep watch for you don't know what day your Lord is coming. He says, understand this, if a homeowner knows exactly when the burglar is coming, he would keep watch and not permit his house to be broken into. So you believer, you believer must be ready all the time for the son of man will come when least expected. Jesus tells us, next blank, he tells us to be ready. He tells me and you to be ready. Some of us remember the day that we walked that aisle and we cried a tear and we prayed a prayer. And then we sat back. And we weren't ready. We sat back. We chilled out. We went to sleep. And we're not ready. Jesus says, be ready. 1 Thessalonians 5 it says to believers be on your guard be on your guard not asleep like the others not asleep in other words he's saying hey COVID zombies snap out of it snap out of your slumber you're in a COVID daze and you've forgotten what your purpose is you've forgotten what Jesus has done for you you've forgotten who you're supposed to be You've just chilled out. Snap out of it. Because the day is coming. Are you ready? You might say, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready. Cool. Okay, is your next door neighbor ready? Because that's why he put you in that house. Is your coworker ready? 
because that's why he put you in that job. Be ready, he says. Snap out of it. Stay alert. Be clear-headed. Night is the time when people sleep and drinkers get drunk. But let us who live in the light be clear-headed, protected by the armor of faith and love and wearing our helmet as the confidence of our salvation. You hear me, Annie Oakley? Wear your helmet as the confidence of your salvation. You and I, we think we need to be so worried about the government controlling us. You think you need to be so worried about the election that's coming up, so worried about whether you should wear a mask or not. Wake up, believers. The day of God's anger is coming. Are you ready? Is your family ready? Are your neighbors ready? You are the light of the world, the salt of the earth. Wake up, snap out of it, and be the body of Christ. You hear me? Be his hands, his feet. That's why you're here in the first place. This is the real deal, and it's coming. It may be this week. It may not be in my lifetime. Either way, be ready. So I'm going to give you three steps, three steps to being ready, okay? So I want you to leave with something practical that you can start doing now, that you can start doing this week. These are not three principles, okay? So I would say, you know, you know me, you, you know me, I'm pretty much in a rut. I'd say, well, you love God, you love others, and you make disciples. But that's not what I want to do today. I want to give you three specific steps, specific steps that you can take to be ready, are you not ready? Get ready. Here's how you can start. Number one, step to being ready. Uh, I would love for you to attend the upcoming Orchard Orientation. Uh, you're, you'll see information about it on the website today. It is coming up on September the 13th. September the 13th. The Orchard Orientation is for all of you who are not currently a partner with the Orchard Church. And right now, if you're thinking to yourself, what, what does it mean to be a partner of the Orchard Church? Hey, the orientation is for you. Because what we're going to do is we're going to sit down and we're going we're to talk together about who we are and why we're here and how we can best serve each other and serve our community. That's what God's called us to do. It's about purpose in life. So I would love for you to attend the Orchard Orientation. The way you sign up for it is you get on our website, theorchard.life. You scroll down to the little upcoming events. You'll see it right there, and you can just sign up right there digitally. You can do it right now in the room, right now while I'm talking, or you can do it right now online with your you know, other device, not the one you're using to watch this. Okay. So first of all, I'm begging you to attend. If you've never been to an orientation, come. By the way, you'll get to meet all of our staff uh, and ministry team leaders, you'll, you'll really get to know us. In this COVID time, there's a lot of us that feel like we don't know each other anymore. Come to the orientation, and it'll get really personal really quick. Second thing you can do is attend the New Life class. Okay, that's coming up the following week, I think, right after the orientation. Yeah, it's going to be on September the 20th. Is that right? It's not showing on my calendar, but I think that's when it is. You can sign up for it the same way. The new life class is going to be great for helping you wake up, snap out of it, and be ready. In the new life class, we go over and establish a personalized spiritual growth plan for everybody in the class. You'll, you'll walk away with a spiritual growth plan. When you have a retirement plan, you know, you have a getting paid every week plan, you have a pay your car payment plan. Do you have a spiritual growth plan? We'll help you with that at the New Life class. Not only that, but we will help you to be able to write and articulate your testimony. A lot of believers don't know how to share their testimony. In fact, they have a misconception that a testimony is some big long story that I, you know, you'll need about 12 hours to hear my testimony. No, nobody wants to hear that testimony. I don't. So we'll help you write your testimony in a nine-sentence format that you can share in about three minutes, two to three minutes with anyone, anywhere, anytime, so that you can be the light of the world. Also, if you've never been baptized, 
please sign up for the new life class. Uh, if you've received Jesus into your life, but you've never taken that step of obedience, the first step of obedience, being baptized, we'll go over that at the new life class as well. So, man, get on our website and sign up for that. The third thing is this, is pray. Pray for our nation. Does our nation need a little bit of prayer right now? I'll say. So I want to tell you about a special prayer effort that we've got going on. Um, do I need to tell about it? Or Larry, do we have a video? I forget now. Is there a video? No, there's not a video. Okay. Um, our staff discovered on Monday, this past Monday, that Franklin Graham, you, you know who Franklin Graham is, right? Franklin Graham, Billy Graham's son. Uh, Franklin Graham is organizing a prayer walk in Washington, D.C. on September the 26th. And we found out about it, that Christians from all over our nation are going to gather together in Washington, D.C. and walk the mall and pray. And we saw that, and our entire church staff said, how can we not? How can we not join our brothers and sisters in the heart of our nation's capital and stand and pray for our nation in view of what's going on in the heart of all the other cities right now where people are coming together to tear down our nation our staff feels compelled that we must stand to pray for the rebuilding of our nation can I get an amen, amen. so on Sunday September 27th which is the day after the prayer walk None of our church staff is going to be here that day. We're going to need you to fill in for us, okay? Can you all help me out that day? So, because we're, we're going to go up and we're going to stand and we're going to pray for our nation. And I would like to invite you to come with us. Yeah, it's a little bit of an expense. We're actually going to go up on Thursday and come back on Sunday. So we'll be there for three nights. You got to pay for a hotel room and, and food for that amount of time. But transportation's on us. We've, we've got, I think, about 60 seats available to travel up there and back. So we've got it covered for you. Want to make it easy for you. Would you consider going and praying with us on that prayer march with brothers and sisters from all over our nation? The details of that will be on our website and are going to be emailed to you. If you've ever given us your email address, we're going to email the details to you I think today, Rebecca, today is Rebecca in the room. She was here earlier. Uh, she's probably in another room right now. Uh, but it's on our website, theorchard.life. Can I see the prayer walk website? Uh, yeah, let me get the page that's prayer walk. If you'll get your device right now, go ahead and get your device out right now. I'll get mine. Go ahead, get your, get your phone. Come on, let me see your phone. Come on, let's, let's look at this together as a group. So you just go to your browser and you type in theorchard.life slash forward slash prayer walk it's really not hard even though it's taking me forever P prayer life 2020 so we have a whole page prayer walk 2020 so we have a whole page that shows about that and I would love for you to go and join us on this it's going to be first come first serve for those seats that we have available uh, to go um you're only responsible for your food and for your lodging there. Some of you may feel like you can't go, but maybe you could help others go. At the bottom of the page, there's a Donate Now button. And if you would be willing to give specifically to help others go and pray, maybe on your behalf, you can do that by just tapping that button, and it takes you right to a page where you can just give. You don't have to like select a fund or anything. You can just give right there on that page and you can just help that trip 100% of the money uh, that you give from that link goes straight to making the trip happen so uh, I would really really appreciate that assistance and I really think that we don't, don't you think we should be praying for our nation right now yes. so we just can't get past it so I'm asking you to be ready be ready stop chilling Stop being in the COVID days. Stop being a zombie. Snap out of it. Wake up and be ready because his day is coming.